God, I want to thank you and praise you again for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the salvation that is so complete. It is what we celebrate this day. When that veil was torn, Lord, when that veil was torn and the Holy Spirit was unleashed 
upon the world. Lord, what a day. What a day. We thank you. We thank you for the victory that we have because of the cross. Lord, this day we want to celebrate that victory. We want to celebrate what you have done in us. Lord, I want to celebrate all that you seek to do through us. And Lord, we pray that as we worship you, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, that you would just worship through us, that we may be your true and faithful worshipers, worshiping in spirit, worshiping in truth. Lord, with clean hands and a pure heart, God, we love you and we seek you. Honor yourself this day through us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Green Acres, rise up together with us today as we sing this song we learned just last week, Sea of Victory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I know knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see.
good to know that we serve a God that fights our battles for us. And we don't ever, ever have to walk in defeat. We don't ever have to walk around whipped because we've already got the victory. And we just sit back and watch and see what the Lord does through it. Y'all continue to worship as we sing victory in Jesus. Welcome to Green Acres. We are so glad you guys are here. Uh, let me be the first to welcome you if you haven't been welcomed already. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, please fill out that Connect card. It's inside your bulletin. I'd love to write you a letter and to say thank you so much for joining us. 
Also, on the back of that Connect card is a prayer request. If you have something going on in your life, maybe something's popped up this week that you would like your staff to pray for. Um, these don't get posted. We don't put these on prayer requests. These are just for the staff eyes. Uh, and so if there's something there that you would like your staff to pray over, please uh, fill that out and put that in the tray as it passes. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard... But there's something kind of big going on today. Uh, I don't know. It's something about some weird football game. I don't know. Um, but today is a special day. Um, not only is it a football game, but more importantly, we started back kind of to our normal schedule. And I'm so excited. I love seeing everybody get here early. Uh, small groups started this morning. Our youth started this morning. Our children starting, uh, started this morning and is now in children's worship uh, kind of in our new, improved children's wing. Uh, and you'll hear more about that as the days come. Um, but lots of things are going on. And so I just want to remind you that because of this big Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, everything starting back, that means tonight our kids' worship starts back, our youth worship starts back, and adult worship, we're continuing to meet. But tonight, and tonight only, we are starting at 5 o'clock. So everything's going to be done at 5 we will be done at 6 to give you enough time to hurry up uh, and get home or come to my house for a big Super Bowl party. Uh, and so I uh, just want to remind you, so tonight at 5, our kids, our youth, and adults are meeting. Uh, and then next week, we're back at 6. Now, I must ask, how many of you even care about the Super Bowl? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are, how many of you are rooting on the Chiefs tonight? How many of you are rooting on Tampa Bay? You bunch of pirates, man. What a junk, man. It's terrible, terrible. Uh, Kansas City is going to be, that's okay. Well, I'll, I'll be glad to rub it in your face next Sunday. Um, but it's going to be a great day. And so let me remind you, tonight, right after everything's done, everybody in this room, uh, and if you have friends, you can invite them too. We're having a Super Bowl party at my house. And I know you're thinking, how's hundreds of people going to fit in your house? They're not. Uh, and so, but I encourage uh, all of you to come um, just to let you know, because I know it's, how many of you are already hungry this morning? Anybody? Man, I'm telling you, I'm already hungry. Sunday school messed up my cot. I'm like, I'm, I'm ready for lunch already. Uh, and so, uh, just to let you know, uh, Jason Hunt, he's cooking us some Boston butts, some ribs, uh, and uh, Laura's fixing some tacos. So if you're coming to my house, always you're going to eat well. Uh, two, we're going to have multiple TVs on with the game, so you're, gonna, you're definitely going to have the game. Three, you're going to be around with your brothers and sisters in Christ, have a good time, and you're going to get to hear me every time uh, the Kansas City scores touchdown after touchdown after touchdown after touchdown, right? And so I'll uh, just let you know it's, it's what's happening. But I encourage you to come. If you come, bring like a side or a dip or something to go along with all the meat that we're providing, uh, and it's just going to be a great time, right? So I'll encourage everyone to come. Also, February 24th, on the back of your bulletin, our ladies are starting a new Bible study um, leading up to Easter, uh, the five weeks before uh, Easter. I think it's going to be a great study. And actually, she didn't know this, but we're going to be doing in here a Sunday morning series leading up to Easter um, very soon. So we'll kind of, we'll see kind of how it goes along together. It's going to be great. And then also, I want to remind all the men, if you're a man in this room, raise your hand. Next Sunday is Valentine's Day, man. Just want to remind you, okay? That gives you a whole week to shop, flowers, chocolates, whatever you do. Next Sunday is Valentine's Day. Do not forget. Women, don't forget your husbands, all right? We like stuff too, okay? It's, it's both for his and hers, right? Uh, and so I just want to remind you guys. Are you guys excited to be here this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand up. Turn around, don't get outside of your pew, and just wave at somebody and tell them good morning. Y'all, let's lift our voices as we worship and let's sing, Fairest, Lord Jesus.
Worship and sing, reckless love.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. so many people have come from so many different places in their walk today and all gathered in this one spot for this one moment. And Lord, the beautiful thing about it is that you ordained it before time began. You knew fully about this moment. You knew fully about every single person that was gathered here today. And Lord, we ask now that you would speak. Lord, our hearts have been turned toward you, has been turned toward the victory that is ours, toward the, the love that is abounding and overwhelming at times. And so Lord, we pray now that our minds would be tuned by your word. Father, we pray that you would use your servant, use Pastor Sean in a mighty way, but Father, speak through your word. Touch our lives. Overwhelm us, Lord. We are so, so weak without you. But Lord, with you, we can do all things. So Father, we pray now that you would speak. And transform us by the renewing of our minds and that through your word. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
great message. A good message for all the Tampa Bay fans today, that no matter what happens, you still have the cross, and so you guys need that. So, uh, can't believe there's that many Tampa Bay fans. I See, y'all a bunch of Brady followers, that's all it is, but we won't go there. Uh, that'll be for tonight. So uh, one thing I did forget to mention during announcements, I just want to uh, just want to point out that for months and months and months as a church, uh, we've been praying. Uh, and then about a month ago, uh, those prayers were came good, uh, and our church grew by one. And today they are back. Uh, Melanie and, and Josh and Baby Harper are back today. Uh, We are excited to have them, but I do want to say, keep your sick, grubby paws away from that baby, okay? Uh, You can love from afar, right? You just love from afar, but keep your sickness away, right? So uh, it's just great to have him here today, um, and uh, we will make sure we will get them a a Chiefs onesie very soon. And so... uh, uh, and so uh, it'll, be a, it'll be a good day. We have been talking about this idea of freedom uh, and walking through the book of Galatians. And this whole idea is that these people have infiltrated the church with the idea that they had to work and do things in order to get to Christ. Uh, in order to get to heaven, they had to do certain things. And they had to, what was was they had to basically... Keep every rule, every regulation of the Old Testament, plus they thought Jesus was a pretty swell guy. So they kind of added that in. So you needed to know Jesus and love Jesus, but you also was dependent upon the works that you do here on this earth. And so Paul wrote a letter, the book of Galatians, to four churches in Galatia to say this is exactly not Anything like I've ever said uh, and pointing out the problems with this and so week after week we've been looking and trying to figure out how we can look at this today and to figure out how we can have freedom and so we've looked at how we can have freedom in uncertain times how we can have freedom of our past how we can have freedom from social pressures last week we can find freedom in finding family this is a church family But today, we want to do something in finding freedom. We need to be different. Look at the person next to you and say, hey, you're different. That's right, right? You're different, right? You're different. We're all different. We all like certain things. We all dislike certain things. Some of us have gifts. Some of us doesn't. But when it comes to us as Christians, as we're reading through this letter to churches, Paul's writing and he says, you guys need to be different. You guys got to be different than the world. You can't be like everybody else that says your salvation or your heaven or your blessing or your prosperity, everything that you are is dependent upon yourself and what you do. And no matter how high you try to climb up the ladder, no no matter how big you try to build this building, it's not up to you. It is really all up to who God is. And so today I want to look at how we become different. So if you have your scriptures, hope you open them up to the book of Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1 and then we're going to kind of skip around. But we're going to look at verse uh, uh, 1 of chapter 5 and it says this. For freedom, there's our word, right? Freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now, we've been talking about freedom. We've been talking about this idea of becoming free of this works-based salvation, right? Of this works-based idea that says, you know, Jesus is good and God is good and heaven is good. But it still is dependent upon me. It's still dependent on how many times I go to church, how many times I put something in the offering plate, how many times I help at a youth function, how many times that I help out a homeless person, how many times do I put some change in the Salvation Army camp. In our minds, we always equate good things to make us a better person. 
And so Paul has been writing and writing and talking and talking about the idea that nothing that you do makes you good. Nothing, right? Scripture tells us we've all sinned and fallen short of the standard of, the, of God. God says, here's the idea. If you want to go to heaven, every person go to heaven. You have to be 100% perfect. Oh, wait a minute. Nobody's perfect. Your God, even your word says you're perfect. Well, then you can't go to heaven. Well, but I want to go to heaven. So there had to be another way. And that was all through Jesus. And that's what we're talking about. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And so here, he's kind of recalling this idea. And he's been talking about it in chapter 4. And he's putting it in an Old Testament kind of conversation to these people, these Judaizers who've infiltrated the church. And he says this, For freedom, if you want freedom, Christ has set us free. We're no longer held to thou shalt not. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. We're no longer held to that. Jesus has set us free. When he died on the cross, it was no longer more about a checklist to say, To prove that I'm not perfect, Jesus came and he walked the earth to say, Sean's not perfect. And the only way that Sean can get to heaven is through what he did on the cross. So if you want freedom, Jesus has already set that to be true. We see this in another writing in Romans chapter 6. It says this, But thanks be to God. That, you, that who you were once slaves of sin have became obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Paul writes in a, in a different book to some Roman Christians and he says, you were slaves. You were slaves to this lifestyle that you had to do, 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 do. You had to do all this stuff, but it was going to result in death. It was going to result in being away from God. It was never going to make you perfect. But now that you're Christians, now you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you're no longer working and working and working to get salvation, now you're working and working and working to bring glorification to God. And for a lot of people, that sounds like the same thing. Sean, are you telling me I have to, when I go to church, that's that's not a work? No, it's not a work. Somebody can go to church every single day the doors are open and still go to hell. But if you're saved... And you come to church, it's not that you have to every single day, but when you come to church and you're surrounded by believers, you're in God's word, you're hearing God's word proclaimed, you yourself are inviting people to church, you're not building onto your salvation, you're building God's kingdom on Alberta Road, right? You're building his kingdom. This over here was you're trying to build salvation. This over here is you're trying to build salvation for somebody else because you already have salvation. You're trying to further God's kingdom. And so here Paul writes and he says, For freedom, if you want to be free, if you want to be free from this rat race, if you want to be free from this do, 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 this building and building and building and doing and doing and doing, you already are. Jesus has set you free. Stand firm means stay strong and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. It's the idea, he's giving us a word picture that says that an animal, an ox or a donkey that's been used to plow fields, that has a yoke that is just pulling and pulling and pulling. And at the end of the day, that yoke of slavery has been taken off and they put this ox or they put this donkey back in a small stall. And this donkey stands there all day, not enough room to lay down. And the next day, they get out and they work him and work him and work him. And and it's his whole life. Paul says, you're that donkey. 
Every day you're trying to build, you're trying to do your pulling, and you're trying to make yourself better. He said, but when you break free of this yoke of slavery, it's like the donkey or this ox gets free, and he runs away, and he looks back at the owner. He looks back at the field he's been working in, and he's like, you know, should I go back? Uh, You know, it would be a good thing. You know, I think I'm going to go back and get beat and whipped every day and work hard labor every single day. Nobody would do that, right? They would constantly run away. They would constantly flee. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, you guys are that donkey. You've been working and working and working for your salvation. Now you've been broken free. You're no longer in slaves. You're no longer in bondage. But now you're looking back and you're saying, you know what? It would be a good thing. You know, I I don't really need freedom. I don't really need just Jesus. But I'm going to go back where I'm in these slaves and I'm in bondage and these people are whipping me and beating me and making me pull this plow up and down this field every single day. Man, that sounds fantastic. To us, we will think of it and we laugh and we're like, man, that's so crazy. But that's what we do. That's what the Galatians did. And that's why Paul's writing, he says, God has set you free, but every time you look back and you say, you know what? I, I, I don't... Uh, This freedom really does look good. To have love and joy and peace, man, this looks great. But you know what? I I really like worrying about everything. You know what? I I really like going to work every single day and and doing that kind of dog-eat-dog world. You know what? I love every single day of just going home and not having joy and and, and kind of looking at things on the computer, trying to fill that hole in in my heart. Maybe drinking and trying to fill that hole in my heart. Maybe being a, a, a bad parent. You know, whatever that it is, that's what we do. We get on this side of freedom where Jesus says, you're free. Let go all of it. And we stand over here and we say, man, you know, the good old days. The good old days. Man, I, I, I'd, love to go, I'd love to go back. And we just don't instantly walk back, right? We tiptoe. We get so small. Oh, well, you know, we'll know. And all of a sudden, we're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. And we're like, how did I end all the way back over here? Jesus, he let me go. For freedom, Christ has set us free. But let's look at how he set us free. How, how can we live different? How can we truly walk away from this life of slavery. Let's look at verse 13. We're going to kind of skip. Because he goes and he talks more about this freedom. But in verse 13, he kind of picks up on the idea and he says, For you were called to freedom. You were called to freedom. Now remember, Paul is writing to a church. Okay. That's good. Pastor Mike can do it. That's everybody say, okay. So Paul was writing this letter to a church. Very good, right? He's writing it to a bunch of Christians, to people who have heard the gospel, who've sat in pews, who've sung songs. They've done this over and over and over again. And as they do this, they keep looking back at their old way of life and they're saying, man, it looks really good. That looks really, really good. I, I know. And Paul writes in verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom. Jesus is telling us, Paul is telling us, that what Jesus did on the cross was ultimately to give you freedom. To give you freedom so that you would never have to look back at the dog-eat-dog world. You never have to look back at this idea of building your own salvation. You never have to look back to this life of slavery, of work, of work, of work. God says you're free. You're called to freedom. As a Christian, you were given freedom. But yet we just keep looking at it. Why would we want to do that? Only do not use your freedom... As an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. If we were called to be free, if we were called not to live in this kind of lifestyle, then he goes on and he says, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity. Because some people in this world, 
in this works world, right? It's a matter what you do, what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in, your status, your popularity, how cool you are. In this world, sometimes these people hear the gospel. They hear the calling of the Holy Spirit, calling the salvation, and they think like, wow, Jesus will give us freedom? Jesus will allow us to do anything and then he'll just forgive me? That's a pretty good gig, right? Man, if I'm over here and I do this and this and this, my parents yell at me, they ground me, the cops kind of get on me, my wife or my husband, you know, man, they do all this. But if I become a Christian, then I can walk over here and I can do whatever I want to do. I can say whatever I want to do. say. I can do whatever and be like, okay, Jesus, forgive me. And then he just forgives me and now I can just go back doing And a lot of times in this mindset, when people learn this idea of work after work after work, that's the idea. Have you ever played the game of Monopoly? That I mean, I I literally, I I think on the eighth day, Satan created Monopoly. For one, the game lasts 177 hours. Is it? I mean, it's 177 hours. It always results. And somebody like myself getting mad, flipping the board, throwing all the hotels across saying this is stupid, right? It's just a game that just, oh, goes on forever. But one, you get to lay it on a little space with a question mark, right? Or a chest. And every once in a while, you get a card and it says, get out of hell free or get out of jail, right? <laughs> same thing, man. If you've ever been to prison, it's the same thing, right? You get out of jail, right? You get out of jail. So when you go around the board, you don't have to pay money. You don't have to get caught there. You can be like, woo, look what I got. And you get to roll again. Oh, man, I'm scot-free. Well, that's what a lot of people think in this world where they're doing work and work and work and work. Oh, Jesus is going to forgive everything? Oh, hold on, hold on. I had an affair on my wife. Jesus, you got to forgive me. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa, I got caught drinking alcohol. You got this, DUI, I got caught with my boyfriend or girlfriend. Oh, yeah, yeah, and see, we just pull out this card every single time. This, this get out of jail, this get out of hell. That's what I said, right? Get out of hell. Oh, you can't do anything. That's what the world thinks. That's what people think. And he says, for you are called to freedom, only do not use this freedom as an opportunity. Do not use this freedom. Do not give this forgiveness that Jesus gives you as a get out of jail card, but use this freedom for what? To serve one another. To serve one another. Have you ever been to a church? Sometimes churches are so needy. You know it? Every time you come to church, they want money. They want your time. They want you down on your knees, tiling a bathroom floor. Then coming over at midnight, grouting a floor. You know, they want you to tear out cabinets. They want electric. They want you to teach the kids. They want you to hold the babies. They want you to go on a youth ski trip. They want you to do this, and they want you to do that. And they want you to stay after and pick up the tables after everybody's already eaten and gone home. And now you're getting home at 4 o'clock, and then Pastor Sean expects you back here at 5 o'clock. Like, oh, my goodness. The churches are so needy. Are they not? Nobody's going to say amen. You guys are all lying. We're needy. Churches are needy. And it's not that we're needy. It's that we give an opportunity to serve. And when you're like, that's kind of funny. And it kind of really is. It's just kind of a, a mixing of words. But in a church, the way that you show somebody that you love them is by what you do for them. Because in a church, we're all good and righteous. We all wear good clothes. We all don't curse in church. We all look good. We're all prim and proper. And we say, good morning, brother. How are you doing today? I'm fine in the word of Jesus. And we're like, okay. But when I got a kid that's crazy and screaming in church, you take my kid, Taylor. He's not in here. He's in children's church. I can talk about him. He's down here beeping and buzzing because his blood sugar is bouncing all over the room, right? I'm so thankful that people, adults, would rather be with my beeping and buzzing kid explaining the gospel in their language so he doesn't have to be bored in here listening to his dad. And those people 
who give their life, who serve me, they don't get to sit in here with the rest of us. They don't get to sit in here and listen to the fantastic worship. They don't get to get, sit in here and listen to the awesome preaching of Pastor Sean. You know what? They're in there with kids all the time. Or they're holding babies all the time. They're in the sound booth moving dials all the time. That's their service. And so here, Paul's writing, he says, when you do this works, your works, your works, and then all of a sudden you see Jesus says, I'll give you freedom, I'll forgive you of your sins, but don't use that as a get out of jail card. Use that, use that now found freedom of service. Because now, if I'm saved, if I've got the get out of jail card, I don't have to worry about how well I dress in church. I don't have to worry about all the things that I have to do to be prim and proper and be wholly elite. What I can do is say, you know what? I have freedom. And so freedom allows me to serve other people. Freedom allows me to show other people that God loves them. God loves their kids. God loves you. Do you think your Sunday school teacher loves giving up their whole week when they come home from work, studying and going through commentaries and illustrators and doing everything, spending 20 plus hours a week. In the, so you can come in for 45 minutes and when you walk out, you're like, good class, good class. They're serving you. And they're serving you because they have freedom. They don't have to work and prove and do all this because they've been set free. They just want to show you more Jesus. They want to love you more to Jesus. They want to push Alberta Road out further. They want God's kingdom to expand. And so Paul writes, and it says, I've called you to this freedom, but don't use this opportunity for your own desires, for your own flesh, for you to build this, but do it to serve. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. The, all the Old Testament is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor. If you have been free, you've been given this freedom, your freedom is to serve and it is to love. I can assure you today, as your pastor, you would not want me in children's church for the next 52 weeks. Love would not exude from my pores after 52 weeks of those kids. You come in and pick up your kids, it'd be duct taped to the walls, you know, like, you know, shackles, toenails ripped off. I mean, it'd be bad. It'd be bad. Right? I'd be like, kids, just sit down. You know, I'd, I'd go crazy. But they're showing love in serving, love to my kids, which also shows me love. Their freedom is serving to me. And so Paul is saying that we should serve, that we should love. Verse 15, but if you bite and devour. These words are used of wild animals in a jungle. Right? So if you put two wild animals together, let's imagine in a cage, they will bite and devour one another. Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. He's saying, if you have freedom, you are to love and you are to serve. But if you're over here working and building and making you the better picture that you think you are, you're like a wild animal. You're ready to bite and devour. You're ready to tear down anything and anyone as long as it makes you higher, makes you bigger. Well, Pastor Sean, I, I don't want that. I, I want to be here. How do we do this? Verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You are to walk by the Spirit. That word walk is the word patera, paterato, uh, which means perpetual, right? You are to walk and to keep walking and to forever walk. It's also um, an imperative verb, which means it's a command. Paul is commanding us, God is commanding us, that we should always walk in the Spirit. Spirit is God, flesh is ungodly. And what's interesting is we're about to read is he gives us kind of this idea that you can only be one of the two. You can only be godly or you can only be ungodly. There is no middle ground. There is no kind of middle of the scale where it kind of balances out. You can either walk by God, walk by the Spirit, or walk by the ungodly, walk by your flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. 
And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. There you go. Right? You can't have godly and ungodly. You only can be one of the two. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Notice that it says you are not led by the Spirit. Where it says led by the Spirit, it's using the same idea of walking. It's the same idea. He says that you need to walk by the Spirit. You need to daily be walking with God, right? You need to be more godly than ungodly. But when he says being led by the Spirit, it's the, it gives the impression of you being a dog. You being a dog and you're on a leash. You can go to my house. I have dogs. If you're coming tonight, they'll be locked up. Don't worry. Uh, but I have dogs. And if you get their leash, my dogs lose they're like going on they just like bounce everywhere right they're ready to go right my dogs we don't ever walk them because we have a huge backyard and that's good enough and who really wants exercise people not me right and so you know i don't walk my dogs but if you take them somewhere you get out the leash they're they're so excited and they get to go and they'll be walking down the street and they're going you know and they're kind of wandering around and then squirrel right and then the squirrel and then all of a sudden i got 95 pounds of squirrel killing machine on the end of a little retractable leash that at 15 feet that leash stops but he never knows it so what happens 95 pounds it takes a while for us to get momentum but by 15 feet he's got momentum and then all of a sudden what happens my arm gets ripped off and he's just dragging it down the street right whoa man you're like whoa you know it's coming that thing he's like whoa right that's what he's that's what we're talking about here it's this whole idea of do we walk by the Spirit. When I walk my dog, my dog has freedom within, within my leash, right? He can, he can do whatever. And you, if you see me and Laura, we're, walk, we're like you guys. We walk, we're like this. You know, because like my dogs, they're not good dogs. They just run anywhere, right? So you're moving the leash all around. But to them, they have freedom. They get to go outside of the fence. But are they really free? I have them by a leash. And I'm taking them. We're moving. We're going outside of their yard. But Sean, they're not free. They're on a leash. If I took them off the leash, you know what happened? For one, squirrels would die. Two, they would probably run away. Three, they'd get hit by a car. But is that good? Is that no, that's not good. But I want freedom. I want my salvation to be my way. I want things to do this. I don't want God holding a leash on me. I want to say and do whatever I want to do, whatever I want to be, and wherever I want to go. And that's fine. You can do that. But squirrels are going to die. You're going to get hit by a car. You're probably going to die. You're probably going to starve. You're going to dehydrate because now you are no longer in... My freedom, my leash might hinder you, but it's for your safety, it's for your concern, it's for your love. But Sean, over here, I get to say who my boyfriend and who my girlfriend and what I do with them is okay. That's okay, you can do that. But over here, the Bible says that I shouldn't have sex till I get married. Uh, that's, that's too much of a leash. Well, here, it's a leash but I don't think anybody wants to stand on the altar with Pastor Sean doing a marriage and say, baby, I love you. And tonight on the honeymoon, you're going to get some STDs because I was not following in God's plan. But over here, Sean, I can do whatever I want. I can, I can drink. I can smoke. I can do whatever I want. I can say where I want to go. That's fine. But over here, you're on a leash because I'm protecting you. I'm holding you back. I'm holding you back because if I leave you to your fleshly desires, you're going to kill squirrels. And you're eventually going to kill yourself. But God says, I have you. And you're on a leash. And man, I got you. And I'm not, I'm not going to let you kill yourself. I'm not going to let you go there because I love you too much. I love you too much to go that far and to be that hurt. I love you too much to go and do that and then have all these ramifications. And the world says, well, I would rather be without a leash. I would rather build my own life. While the Christians say, I'd rather be on a leash with God than to be in a field with Satan. 
You see the difference? And so Paul says you've got to be different. You've got to walk in the Spirit. And then he gives us this whole list. What does it look like to be on this side? What does it look like to live to the fleshly desires? And he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And I know what happens. We read lists like that, and we, every person in this room would be like, well, that's not me. I mean, those are, those are, whew, those are bad words right there. Like, pastor, you're going to talk about those in church? Those are, those are bad words. But let's look at those words. Sexual immorality. The Greek word is pornania. So where we get pornography. Has anybody ever heard of anybody that's looked at porn? Yeah, there's people in this room right now. There's people in this room right now that, that can't stop looking at it. There's people in this room that probably have stopped and have gone past that. But the world tells us that we can do whatever we want. The word pornia means all illicit sexual acts. Everything is okay. It doesn't matter if it's with a guy or with a girl, with an animal, with anything. It doesn't matter. You can be who what you want to be. It doesn't matter what you were born with. You just tell us what you are and how you are going to go out and to have sex. Well, Pastor Sean, I would never do that. Oh, you might not, but the world sure is. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, impurity, that word impurity is a gross word. The word impurity means to ooze or to fester. It also means to pus. Ever had a sore that's got infected and it's just gross? That's what the word means. It means ceremonial and clean. It means that you're working and when God looks at you, you're not clean, you're not holy. You're a person that when God looks at you and says, that's not the idea of perfect I had in mind. And that could be across the board on anything, not just sex, not just drugs, not just anything, anything. Are, are you a clean, are you a pure, a moral person? What about sensuality? It's this idea of being without restriction. Without restriction. Man, you could do anything without restriction. There's the, there's the word. Idolatry, worshiping anything that's not God. We joke about it. I mean, I'm not joking the Chiefs are going to win, because they are. But, but we joke about the Super Bowl. How many people do you know worship a brown skin ball? It amazes me. It amazes me. When you talk to somebody and they're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, the stats on uh, Tom Brady, he was like, dude, they'll do that for like 37 years all through his career. I don't know how old he is, but I know he's old. And so you kind of, you know, he goes like on and on and on about the thing. I'm like, Awesome. When's the last time you church? Oh, I can't go to church. I don't have enough time for that. I can't. The pastor talks too fast. I don't know about that. Are you kidding me? You just quoted all these stats. I read an article yesterday. A man paid $26,000 to get into the Super Bowl this year. I'm just telling you right now, pastors would love to go to the Super Bowl. I don't know, man, $26,000. I would because I'm going to scalp it. He's not, he's not smart. Right? I'm with you, right? Be like, oh, yeah, pastor, love that, right? $26,000. I don't know if I pay you $26,000 if you kidnap a kid. You know what I mean? $26,000, that's a lot. How much do you love the game of football? That is a lot of money. People worship all kinds of things. And you just go through these lists, right? Sorcery, which is talking about pharmacia. It's talking about drugs, mind-altering drugs, uh, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, this idea of just uh, kind of this ongoing hatred among people. Have you ever hated somebody? I think we're all there, right? And so Paul says, if this is you, this is what you want to build your salvation, this is what it looks like. No matter if you have good intentions, it always leads back to bad things. That's what the flesh will always want. But notice this, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. Now put your finger there and look back at verse 19. It says, here are the works of the flesh. Works, with an S, fruit, 
of the Spirit. The works of the flesh are plural. See, when you try to build your own salvation, when you try to do your own things, you're constantly doing, you're grabbing. You're going to do one, two, three. You're going to have lots of kind of pokers in the fire. But when you get to the godly side, when you get this freedom that God gives you, it says you get one thing. You get the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I've heard it my whole life. You know, people will be like, now, Pastor Sean, I don't have all the fruits of the Spirit. I don't have that patient one because you put me in a traffic jam and, whew, i just gone. It's funny, but it's a lie. All Christians, all people who believe in Jesus, you get the, the, singular, fruit of the Spirit. You get this idea of what God wants. And then he goes into this list of what this is. Now look at this list compared to the other list. The fruit of the Spirit, the singular gift that you get is what? It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We get all these things. We look at all these bad things, and over here we get all of these good things, right? We have love. We have agape, the sacrificial love. We have joy, which is chara, which means that we're just happy. Some of you have not been happy in a long time. And it's not God's fault. God says you have happiness. If you are here, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have love for others, but you also have inside of you true happiness. You have this idea of peace. That word peace means tranquility. It's the idea you're just kind of like, I just need a second. I just need to go to my happy place. Right? There, I saw last night, there's a, there's a Toyota commercial. And it's a mom, she's driving whatever new SUV is, and dad's in there, two kids are in the back, and they're going camping. And so they pull out of the driveway, and all of a sudden, the kids are like, when are we going to get there? Mom, we're going to get there. I need to go bathroom. And, the dad, and then the husband's in the passenger. He's like, baby, what, did you pack the cookies? Did you pack that? You know, just husband being a husband. And it just shows, like, it goes on and on and on. And then she pulls into, like, the camping site. And she's like, we're here. And the, the husband's like, yay. And the kids are like, woo. And they jump out, and they jump, and the husband talks about, "Baby, you coming?" She says, "I just, I just need a minute. I just need, a, I just need a minute in my happy place, right?" Kids then drove her crazy. Her husband then drove her crazy. She needed that tranquil. She needed that peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all these things. And what's so important? You can dive into these words; they mean so much. But here's the most important part. Look at the end of verse twenty-three. Against such things there is no law you know what paul's saying he says even in the lost world even in the world over here building salvation doing whatever they want these things are what the lost world wants love joy peace patience kindness he said there's no law against these there's nobody that forbids these this is really what the world gets Why do you work so much at, why do you spend so much time at work? So what, you'll make better money? Your wife will love you more, your kids will love you more, you'll have more money, it'll bring you more joy, it'll bring you peace when you're able to buy that car, you're able to do this. Well, why, why do you cheat on your wife? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Because you want love, because you want all the things that the world truly wants and is working for. He says, I've got it. You've got it all over here. And even these are so good, even the lost world wants them. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. 2,000 years ago, God's Son stepped out of heaven, took earthly form, human form, and walk this earth. 30 years later, he sacrifices himself. He dies on a cross with all the sins, all the bad things that we would do, all the things that we would try to build and work and get to try to find our own freedom, our own, diver- our own devotion. He would take all of those and he would die on a cross. He was crucified for those. And because of those, he lived perfectly, and now he allowed us a way to get that get-out-of-jail card. And able to know 
That it's not by our works that we are saved, but it's all by Jesus' work, his crucifixion and resurrection that we are saved. And so when it says here that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh, when you are saved, you are crucified with Christ. You guys remember what a baptism looks like? Right? You get up there and you have a baptism. They remove that little white thing. And I'm pretty sure there's like plexiglass behind there. And you see the water level, right? The idea of a baptism, it's a, it's a word picture, right? It's a picture showing what happened. And the idea, if this is the water level, this is you in standing in the water. You are on the Christ. You're on the cross with Christ. But when you are put under the water, you are put under the ground, you are buried to all of your sins, you are buried to all these works, to all this salvation, so that when you come up out of the water, you are like Christ, resurrecting out of the grave, and now you are in godly form. You are a new person. And so here, when Paul's saying that you've been crucified with Christ as a Christian, yes, you've been crucified, but you're not dead yet. You've spiritually crucified yourself, but you haven't physically crucified yourself. So there's still going to be times when as a Christian, you're over here with the free card, the get out of jail free, but you're going to be like, man, those, that looks really good. You know, I, that, you know, this looks good. Oh, no, no, no I got to go back. Our human flesh is always going to be calling that way. But it's Christ that is always pulling us back because of his crucifixion. And this morning, we're going to melt this together perfectly with taking the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And what's so funny, in the, in the last minutes, in the last hours that Jesus gets to spend with the 12 men who kind of stood by him. He, they walked with him. They understood him. He taught them. They knew everything. And in the last minutes, in the last hours, Jesus didn't want to have a Bible study. Jesus didn't want to have a theology study. Jesus wanted to have a meal with them. He wanted them to walk away with something that even though that he was leaving, they were still going to be alive on this earth. That when things started to go wrong, when they started to look at the desires of the flesh and say, you know what, those look good. But every time they would see a piece of bread, every time they would see a cup of wine, they would be remembered of Jesus in the cross. And they say, oh, no, no, no. I can't go that way. I am crucified with Christ. I would rather be on God's leash than in Satan's field. This is where I want to be. And that's what we're doing this morning. In just a minute, after, after the time of giving you a moment to realize what is happening, is we're going to take some bread and some grape juice to remember what Jesus did for us. But the question is this this morning. Are you trying to build your own salvation? Are you trying to do all these evil fleshly things of trying to build and try to get your own love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness? Because this morning we just read that the only way you can be free, the only way you can truly express love, joy, peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and self-control is to truly come to the cross. Is to remember what Jesus did for you. Scripture tells us that before you were ever even born, God knew that you were going to do wrong. He still loved you, and he still went to the cross for you. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is say, Jesus is enough. Is Jesus enough for you this morning? For those of you who, for many of years, you've said Jesus is enough. Scripture tells us that when we come to the Lord's Supper table, we're to, we're to do a little uh, kind of inward look upon ourselves. Look at our lives. Are, are we still standing on the side of freedom? Are we still standing on the side of love and serving others? Or are we kind of looking backwards to 
the things of the flesh and just slowly creeping by. Scripture says that we ought to look at ourselves and repent of our evil fleshly ways and to remember that Christ has given us the ultimate freedom this morning. So this morning, in just a minute, we're going to pray. And as we pray, I think Mike is going to sing a song. We're going to sing a song. If you've never given Jesus your faith, of saying, you're enough, Jesus. This morning is that time. But for those of us in the room, like myself, that's a time for you to look inward and to say, do I believe Jesus is enough? Am I living like Jesus is enough? Or do I keep looking back to the things of the flesh? Let's pray, Father, We love you. We thank you so much. We thank you for your words. We thank you for your scripture. The thing that we want the most is the gifts that you give us. Is the freedom that you give us. Father, this morning, we were told to look at two things. One, Do we believe that you're enough? Do we believe that you're enough to give us freedom, to give us salvation? Or do we try to do things on our own? Or secondly, those for those of us who believe that you're enough, to truly look inward and to say that we want to walk in the Spirit, to quit looking at the things of the flesh, but to focus our eyes on Jesus and to love and to serve others for your kingdom, not for our kingdom. In your precious name, amen.